The topic here is that the writer of Psalm 121 has promised God's divine protection forevermore. Title of our message, Quoth the Righteous Forevermore. Anybody have any idea? Who, who knows what that refers to? All right, you, that's the cultured group. You guys stay on this side, everybody. No, I'm just kidding. Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I read that when I was three years old. That's a toddler bedtime story, right? Father, thanks for our morning so far. We've uh, been blessed, Lord, to bring our voices before you in song. You do inhabit the praises of your people. That's a promise. And so we know that you, your presence is being made known in this place in a glorious way. Walk in our midst, Lord, and speak to us between the soul and the spirit where only you can penetrate and where your love can make a difference. Many of us are hurting, Lord, physically, emotionally, economically, and every other way that you can think of. Be comfort to us, Lord, today as you promise. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, amen. Amazon gives you the option before you add the item to your cart. Add a protection plan. I'm always uncertain if I should buy a separate protection plan for a new device or appliance. It seems like if I don't, the thing breaks right away. But if I do, the thing lasts forever. And so it's always either a waste of money or I feel like a fool. I find it extremely stressful because that box is there, am I gonna check it or not? Some years ago, I bought a protection plan for a cell phone. I don't want to disparage the company by mentioning them by name, but it rhymes with Horizon. <laughs> My phone went on the fritz. Good thing I had purchased that protection plan because it guaranteed me a replacement phone. When it came in the mail, I quickly learned that replacement did not mean new. It was a previously owned, much used Motorola flip phone. I think I saw Don Johnson using it once on Miami Vice. And it was so old that it had an antenna. Remember antennas on cell phones? You'd get your phone out and lift the antenna. Man, those are the days. The car I'm driving now, that Toyota CHR with all the rear window decals that make you think I've lost my mind, it's got a three-year factory warranty, bumper to bumper. Now, it's a lease, so I'm going to turn it in before the end of three years. In stereotypical behavior, the salesman added an extended five-year warranty to my invoice. When I caught it, he said, oh, sorry, I don't know what I was thinking. I do. <laughs> I'm no fool, though. I did get the undercoating. There's a Hebrew word, I pronounce it shamar. It's used six times in Psalm 121. You might miss the repetition because different Bibles have chosen a lot of different English words to translate it, such as keep, protect, guard, keep watch, preserve, and watch over. The New King James, for example, translates it using three English words, keep, keeper, and preserve, even though it is the same Hebrew word throughout. If you read Psalm 121 with a single translation of the word, I want to use the word protect this morning, it sounds like this, he who protects you, he who protects Israel, the Lord is your protector, the Lord shall protect you from all evil and he shall protect your soul, the Lord shall protect your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Psalm 121 celebrates Israel's divine protection plan. It's a lifetime warranty. In fact, as we'll see, it's a promise of eternal forevermore protection to the believer. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, your protection plan is guaranteed. And number two, your protection plan is grace. Let's look at the guarantee in verses one and two. Psalm 120 through 134 are the Psalms of ascent. They were sung as the Israelites traveled from all over the land to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem to attend the three major annual feasts. Travel was mostly on foot. Jesus, for example, for most of his earthly life, would have traveled 150 miles round trip at a speed of roughly 18 to 20 miles an hour to attend the feasts of unleavened bread or Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. Travel was dangerous, foot travel especially. Parable of the Good Samaritan highlights one of the dangers that from robbers, 
a traveling man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered a band of robbers. They robbed him because that's what robbers do. They beat him and they left him for dead. Now you should immediately raise your hand and ask, uh, if the Lord has promised to protect a believer, how is it that the man could be robbed, beaten, and left for dead? Well, regarding his protecting his followers, Jesus prayed for us in the Gospel of John, and we learn a little bit about what that protection means by the words that he chose. He said to his father, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Here we learn, among other things, that God's divine protection of keeping or protecting us does not exclude us being left in a hostile environment ruled by an evil one who goes about like a ravenous lion seeking whom he may devour. Jesus also told his followers, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation." Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Not too many plaques in houses have that as a promise, a divine promise, uh, but the Lord essentially is promising you, uh, predicting that you will have trouble in this world. He said, don't worry about the trouble because I have overcome the world. Doesn't mean you're going to avoid the trouble. He said, he's going to be with you in your trouble. And so Jesus' guarantee of protection is not a promise you will be free from trouble. You're you're going to encounter lots of it. When the Apostle Paul was first saved, he was told how much he must suffer for the sake of the gospel. And man, did he suffer. But he declared that none of his suffering could separate him from the love of Jesus. The Lord kept him and the Lord protected him. At one point, Paul was stoned to death. Uh, And then apparently he was miraculously healed because he got up and brushed himself off and said, let's go back and preach to those people. Uh, so that's the problem. Paul didn't get up and say, Lord, I thought you promised to protect me. And if his companions traveling with him had said, Lord, uh, Paul, didn't the Lord promise to protect you? And he says, well, he has. While I was dead, I had the opportunity, you know, I would have gone to heaven to be with the Lord, absent from my body, but precious with the Lord. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. And, and so he would not have asked this question at all. It didn't bother him in the least that he was suffering this trouble. He expected it. I think of Jesus' words to Paul as something unique because he would have such a profound ministry. Uh, Now, it's true, Paul the Apostle did have an amazing ministry. He also said, be like me, for I'm like Christ, and so he's just an average believer. God didn't choose him because he was so powerful or so anything. He was an average believer who God put on a certain path and used in, in that way. We're just average believers that God puts on our path and uses in a way that blesses him. And the truth is, Jesus did speak these same words in a different fashion to every believer when he said, in the world you will have tribulation. That's essentially what he told Paul. Paul, in the world you're going to have tribulation. You're going to serve me and have tribulation. Believer, you're going to serve me and have tribulation. And so I'm establishing this groundwork, this framework, to show us what we already know, that trouble and tribulation does not preclude God's protection of us. We also know that we live in the church age when God is glorified in our weaknesses. He keeps us in and through terrible troubles. The world sees a deep and abiding love between us and him, and they marvel. And so let's get into the psalm itself. Verse 1, it's a song of ascents. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. As a child, I would anticipate that one spot on the freeway from which you could excitedly see the Matterhorn from your car. If you lived in Southern California and you traveled down to Disneyland, uh, there was, I don't know where it was anymore because I don't even know if the freeways are the same, but you used to be able to get to Disneyland from San Bernardino in about 45 minutes, not 12 hours uh, like it takes now. But uh, there, was, there was that one spot, me and my brothers would always want to be the first one to see the, the tip of the Matterhorn just sticking out because then we knew we were close to the happiest place on earth. At some point, the road-weary traveler to the temple could lift his head and excitedly see the city on the hill and know that they were going to make the ascent up to the temple. 
from whence comes my help? I read that as a rhetorical question. Of course, your help will come from the Lord. That's what he's going to say in verse two, but you already know the answer to that. It's not like this psalmist is saying, I wonder who's going to help me in life. It's a rhetorical question. Simba told Zazu, I laugh in the face of danger. We look our dangers and troubles in the face and say, from whence comes my help? It's like saying, wait until you, my dad gets here or whatever. I mean, is, I, I, mean I've, I think I've told you this story before, but it's a favorite. And uh, Halloween, back when Halloween was Halloween, and, and you take a, a pillowcase and get a sack full of candy. And so uh, it's a unique situation where I lived across the street from a house that had been condemned and was the haunted house that year. Uh, and so I was over there as a kid, I was maybe fifth grade, fourth or fifth grade, and I had all my candy because I was on my way home across the street, but they had a band playing, playing the caretakers, uh, and uh, they had a hearse for a car. It was really, you know, and stuff. And these older boys behind me, maybe, you know, junior high, high school, they started giving me a hard time and pushing me, and there were two or three of them, I think. And um, so then I, I, I went to leave, and they pushed me down, and they took all my candy. You see why I am who I am between that and the the jack-in-the-box? My childhood was fraught with assault. Now, little did they know that I lived across the street. So I ran across the street crying, and my dad and my oldest brother, who was out of high school by then, and my next oldest brother, who was an outstanding middle linebacker for the high school. I I actually have a memory of this. I remember pointing from the porch right across the street to this group of boys. And then I remember my brothers leaving. And then I remember my brothers bringing back my candy. And I don't know what intervened, but I'm sure it was heinous. Uh, Anyway, so it's like that. Uh, My help comes from the Lord. Hey, you guys want to beat me up? I'm going to go across the street and tell my brothers. And uh, I'm going to get my candy. In fact, I have more than my candy back, as I recall. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Why appeal to creation here? Well, for sure, it shows God's raw power. If he can speak the universe into existence, he can also help us. But I see something more than power. There's providence. This is a reminder that God has always had a plan for creation. He created the universe, created the earth in it, created the Garden of Eden in it, and he put man in it so that we would be loved by him. Because love requires choice, God gave man free will to disobey him. Creation was ruined by that disobedience, but God immediately promised he would redeem both creation and mankind. We would return to his original plan to love him freely, only in the very end with a sanctified free will incapable of sin. And so that's the plan, uh, to create man in the garden and have a relationship with him. And then the plan went, not really, I, I, I don't know if it would be wrong and heretical to call it plan B, uh, but once the, the man had sinned, there was another plan, uh, and God implemented it immediately, and it's the plan you see played out on the pages of the Bible. The whole Bible is really, in one sense, the bringing of Jesus Christ to die for the sins of the world, and then his coming again to restore the world, uh, and then in, finally eternity. And so it's one story uh, from start to finish. And God's plan is guaranteed by both his power and his providence. He provides for it in the progressive revelation of the Bible. A plan like that requires time. As we wait for its completion, evil has reign over the earth in the hearts of men. God protects us in this world of turmoil and tribulation in order to represent his love to sinners. As I've told you many times, because I think it's important, The number one argument people have against God is that if he is all-loving and all-powerful, which he is, why does he allow suffering? Terrible suffering at that. Uh, You sometimes find these lists of, you know, every 10 seconds, every 50 seconds, every three minutes, something heinous happens around the world. You hear all the time in media, usually the believer has no response or a weak one, like God works in mysterious ways. It really annoys me when I'm watching TV or a movie and, you know, there's somebody who's quasi-religious or is talking about believing in God, and then the, usually the main character just goes on a tirade against God. I mean, it's obvious there can't be a God or that he's a tyrant if he would allow this kind of thing to happen. I always want to jump into the TV set and say, 
He's allowing this to happen because he's waiting for you to get saved. Because I'll tell you what's really harsh, you going to hell for eternity, perishing in your sins. And yeah, I know the world is, you know, is evil and wicked and terrible and the, the sum total of it blows your mind, but not compared to losing a soul for eternity. And so the answer is this. God allows suffering because he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to eternal life in a relationship with Jesus. The shorter version of that is God's long-suffering waits. And, and that's what is going on. God, as I've told you many times, he could pull the trigger on this thing and it'll be over in seven years plus a thousand years. But he's waiting patiently. Maybe he's waiting for you. Meantime, God's protection of believers is guaranteed. Doesn't mean you won't be robbed on the road homeward. Means that like Job, if you are, you'll say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. My favorite trio from the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When threatened with being executed in the fiery furnace, they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. They saw no contradiction in God's protection one way or the other. They said, look, God will deliver us. He will protect us through delivering us, or he won't, but it's still his protection. There's nothing you can do to us to make us worship you rather than the living God, because the only thing you can do is torture and kill us, and we don't care, because that is the greatest thing, uh, the, in one sense, a great moment of protection, and probably some of your people will get saved when they see uh, the martyrdom that you bring upon us. It's a win-win either way. Your protection plan is grace. We defer to folks who are experts in their field. Their knowledge and experience puts things into a proper perspective. Pretty much every A-list Bible character is an expert in tribulation and suffering. A great summary statement is found in the chapter of the Bible we fondly refer to as the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11. I'll read a portion of it. Uh, believers through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the enemy. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others, of course, were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Admittedly, the idea that being sawn in two is protection sounds like a hard sell. Hey, Isaiah, you're going to be sawn in two. They think it refers to Isaiah. Or he was maybe pulled apart, you know, in the way they used to with horses. Oh, anyway. And, but, and, you know, but the thing is, I guess what I'm saying is if you had said to Isaiah, Isaiah, what do you feel about God's protection? You know, your, your Channel 7 news, you know. Isaiah, you're about to be pulled apart by two horses. Or the, they're sharpening the, uh, the saw and they're going to cut you in half at the waist. How do you feel about God's protection now? He would say, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Well, he wouldn't say that, obviously, but he would say something like that. There was no way he would say, well, I was hoping for some divine protection, but I guess I'm on my own. I'm beside myself wondering. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Notice the change of speaker. The remaining verses are spoken to the traveler. Perhaps a fellow pilgrim comes along and ministers to the first. Uh, it, it, as a device, it helps draw us into the action. It it it's, um, makes us feel that we're there being spoken to as well. They are a lyrical, poetic way of describing the Lord's protection along the road home. Obviously meant for the pilgrim headed for Jerusalem, but not without application for us because we are pilgrims headed for the new Jerusalem. The Ford Motor Company used to have a tagline, maybe they still do, quality is, quality is, job one. 
There's always somebody in this section that's, if you want to get smart, sit over here. Quality is job one. Your sanctification, your becoming more like Jesus, is job one with him. He began a good work in you, and he will be faithful to complete it. He will not allow your foot to be moved. I read this and the following promises and conclude that the road will be well-maintained, clearly marked, and without danger. We've seen already that's not true biblically in the life of a believer, and the Bible isn't contradicting itself. And so over all of these promises, I would write the famous inspired words from Mike Tyson. <laughs> I've used this before. I love it. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Your plan needs to be tested and proven. When I was younger, much younger, I was 17 years old, my brothers and I uh, were involved in Taekwondo. And I, I never got to black belt. I think I was a red belt, which was their version of a brown belt. I was, thought I was pretty good, you know. I could throw white belts around like crazy and stuff. And so, uh, I mean, I wasn't cocky, but I thought I had really achieved something. But, you know, you, you got to test yourself a little bit. And so one day our sensei, our instructor, brought his master from Korea, Pak Bukwa. Five foot six. He had a haircut like Mo from the Three Stooges. Really gentle, nice guy, though, only spoke Korean. And he wanted to spar with us to see what our level of uh, death was, I guess. But anyway, and so we're sparring. And of course, you know, you know bam, you're doing your thing and, and kicks and punches. And he's just hardly moving and deflecting everything. You can't get near him. You can't touch him. I did a spinning back kick. And the next thing I know, he was holding me. Uh, he, I was off the ground. And he wasn't right. I mean, it was just, you know, and he, he wasn't being weird or anything. He was just doing that. And then all of a sudden, while we're doing all this, he goes, side the kick. Boom! <laughs> while I was still thinking about what it, oh, he kicked me in the side and out of the ring. And so I thought, you know, I have a ways to go uh, before I can think that I, you know, my plan was okay until I got punched in the mouth. And then I figured out what was really happening. I can't be certain God is faithful to keep me from stumbling unless I encounter stumbling blocks in my path. It's theoretical until I get punched. I might have a glass jaw all the while I think I can't be knocked down. Those of us in Christ love to quote 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. It presumes we will have trouble. It promises God's grace is abundant in our trouble. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Now, the sun, I can understand because we live here in the Central Valley. Everybody's got a gigantic hat. By the way, did you see, did you see that meme on the Internet? They had a, like a six-foot brim. It's a social distancing hat. It was the greatest thing. And so I understand the sun but how can the moon strike you? When's the last time you had a moon tan? Uh, never. Now, but an Israelite, they would immediately understand this reference. In their wilderness journey, God manifested himself to Israel as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So it's saying that day and night, God will protect us from these elements. And it's obviously metaphorically speaking as well. The Holy Spirit takes that reality and applies it to each Jew individually here. God will similarly be with each of them. And so the idea is that what God did for the nation in the Old Testament, he's really doing for me spiritually uh, at this point if I'm a Jew. Jesus said he would never leave us. He would never forsake us. Then he left us. But he didn't leave us alone. He didn't forsake us. He gave us the promise of the Father, the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a minute. We tend to think of God, the Holy Spirit, as a spiritual battery that can diminish in power over time. But our theology is, and the theology of the Bible is, that he is the third person of the triune God. The Holy Spirit is almighty, all-powerful. He shares all the attributes of, of God. And so he can't be any less powerful. If he indwells you, he is powerful. And he can't diminish in power and still be God. Now, while that's true, we can experience refreshings of the Holy Spirit, but he is always at maximum strength. 
In the book of Acts, we read this, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. We tend to look at that as a fresh filling of the Spirit or as if they needed more of the Spirit. They had just healed the lame man. Uh, they uh, had just been arrested, and they had just been warned by the Jewish leaders to quit talking about Jesus, and they met it all with boldness. And now they prayed really not for boldness to do that, but just that they would ha keep doing that in the boldness they already had. That's how I read that. And so we, we just need to get out of this idea that we can ex exhaust the Holy Spirit. You old comic book fans will remember the JSA, the Justice Society of America. Anybody remember the Justice Society of America? You would have read about it in the Justice League comics where they had a second earth encounter with the Justice Society. Crossover? What is the matter with you people? <laughs> Justice Society of America, they were the golden age precursors to the Justice League. I'll, I'll confess, I just remembered this because, and I'm going to tell you how contemporary this is. On the CW network, which is more for teenagers, it seems, there's a show called Stargirl. And I watched the beginning of it because it's a superhero show. And at the beginning, the Justice Society of America is fighting their evil arch foes. And I thought, well, I haven't thought about that for years. And so the Justice Society had guys like Dr. Midnight, the Spectre, the Atom, Starman, and Black Canary. And they also had Our Man, a scientist, Rex Tyler, that was his alter ego. He developed a pill, Miraclo, which gave him superhuman strength, but you guessed it, only for an hour at a time. I always thought that would be cool. The power of the Holy Spirit isn't found in a spiritual formula. We don't just have power a little at a time, and then run out and say, oh man, I wish I was having this trial at a time when I was empowered. In order for that to be true, the Holy Spirit would have to leave you, which he doesn't. So hear me carefully. I'm going to say this to start with. Devotions, Bible reading, prayer, ministering to others, sharing with others, coming to church, all of the Christian disciplines are extremely important to your sanctification and your growing in Christ. But none of them add strength to the Holy Spirit. And so if you go out one day and you weren't able to or you blew off your devotions and something happens, it doesn't mean that you can't meet it in the power of the Holy Spirit. He is not weakened by your uh, actions. He is not strengthened by your actions because he is God, the Holy Spirit. And I, lately, I think you've seen in the last few years, we've been emphasizing this a lot. You need to know who you are in Christ and, and know that you are capable of doing all things through Christ who strengthens you. And, and that happens in the ministry of the Spirit. And so the Bible, you know, we, for years we've also been saying that God's Word is God's enabling. Whatever you read in the Bible that you're supposed to do, you already can do it in Christ. Maybe can't do it perfectly. Maybe you're a red belt instead of a black belt. Uh, but God will show you that, and he will continue to hone you into his image. But you can do it. You can avoid sin. Uh, you don't have to give in to these various things. You can save your marriage and all. Uh, you know, you, you can endure that illness and that sickness. You don't need to fall away, whatever it might be. There's no formulas. There's just a person. Our relationship to God, the Holy Spirit, needs to switch from begging for him to believing him. Verse 7, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The simple yet profound truth is that because of Jesus, Satan, sin, and death are defeated. I already quoted the Apostle Paul, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. No matter what situation Paul was in, shipwrecked over and over again, beaten over and over again, thrown in prison over and over again, uh, left for dead probably more than once, even though we only have the one time, robbers beat him up and took his clothing. He said he was naked and hungry and all of these things. In every situation, he would turn to you and say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This doesn't do anything to change God's uh, forevermore protection in my life. The fact that I got beat up is a glorious thing because that's how they treated Jesus. And this is the time in which we live. We live in a time, the church age, in which God is glorified in weakness. He can heal 
but he chooses not to heal very much because he'd rather be glorified in our weakness. And if God chooses to not heal you, then your declaration is for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. It covers all the bases. We who are in Christ will one day be resurrected or raptured and forever be in the likeness of the Lord. Verse 8, the Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Great words of comfort for someone almost to the temple facing a return journey. And in a nutshell, the Christian always has grace abundant for the journey because of the Holy Spirit. You don't need some extended warranty in terms of a program recommended by the latest book or video series. You need to realize who and what you are and what you will become as you're changed day to day from glory to glory. Forevermore, it's a one word key that unlocks the wisdom of God with regards to our journey. If my thinking is forevermore, I will live my life as a forevermore. I was thinking that might be a great title for a Christian. You know, they're always coming up with new names for Christians. Uh, the young, restless people don't like Christian anymore, so they call you Christ followers. We've been calling Christians people who are in Christ because that's actually Paul's favorite description of what it means to be a Christian. But uh, as an aside, you could just be a forever. I'm one of the forevermores. Sounds like a TV show, right? Uh, you see these things, the 4400 or the 100 or this or that. You and I are forevermores. And that shift in perspective allows me to see God's divine protection upon every footfall towards the heavenly city. Whether I stumble or not, I can't ultimately because God is protecting me.